welcome back to the Health Tech Pigeon podcast brought to you by SOMX. And we break down the health tech news stories for you every single week. I'm Jessica, and today I am joined by James and Hugh, who is our producer this week, because our regular producer, Adma, is living it up on a beach in Mexico. Now, it's been a bit of a quiet news week this week, so we're waiting for all of the journalists everybody else seemingly in health tech and Adma to rejoin us from the beach, finish off their last pina colada so we can really get into some big headlines come September, which I'm sure they will. But uh, this one sounds like it's going to be an AI heavy week. Sorry, not sorry. But before we get there, James, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you. Looking forward to getting to it. Well, let's... So our first story this week comes to us from Tech Target, and it's a survey reminding us that AI is still sexy. And what it's telling us is that AI really is still the most exciting emerg- emerging technology in healthcare, unsurprisingly. James, you have had a read of this survey. What is it actually telling us? Well, what the survey's done is it's basically <laughs> it's, it's sort of stating the obvious to begin with, in that AI is the number one uh, technology people think is going to improve care and administration healthcare. Okay, that's not going to. I mean, it literally has created headlines, but I wouldn't have said that would create headlines. Um, the thing that I took from it though is they asked about which specific parts of AI, and they spoke to people about different things that people consider ai and i think that's what i've taken from this which is that there are one two three four five six seven eight nine areas where ai can help some of them are things like generative ai ambient speech recognition large language models those are things that people call ai quite generically so again that's something that we can take from this what do you actually mean when you're talking about ai and the other things category i guess is areas where ai can be deployed clinical care uh, claims decision support and all of that's been bundled into a single graph of the most mentioned areas relating to ai of which generative ai is top clinical care is second and ambient speech recognition is third i think what as what i took from this really is the confusion that people actually can create when they just say AI. And what this really neatly shows is that when you say AI, what are you talking about from a technology perspective? Are you talking about generative AI? Are you talking about ambient speech recognition? Are you talking about a large language model? Are you talking about a predictive model or any of the other types? Or are you actually talking about a clinical area related to that or an an application? Are you talking about clinical care? Are you talking about messaging? Are you talking about claims? Are you talking about decision support? So really what I'm taking from this and the message I think we need to proliferate amongst the healthcare community is when you say AI, it's really worth classifying what you mean. And why that is important for me is as we go through this journey in healthcare of AI and trying to cut the wheat from the chaff, trying to figure out where the best applications of AI are, where the places are that we don't want AI AI or that they don't work, it's going to be really important that we're very clear on exactly what those use cases are because what we run the risk of is calling AI as a whole good or bad. And that might be AI. So for example, taking one of the most mentioned areas relating to AI, clinical care. The problem is that if we say, okay, we've tried AI in clinical care and it's not really working that well and it's made some mistakes and there's been morbidity and there's been mortality, all of a sudden AI gets a really bad name across the whole of clinical care. Well, that's not great, is it? What was it? Well, it was actually 
a large language model that did this specific th- thing in this specific area of clinical care and, and this was the application and this was the method like, and that didn't work and this is what we learned and this is what we're going to do next time. That's a much better narrative. And so I think, the, the, as I say, the main thing to take away from this for me is where we're talking about AI and going forwards now, I think it's really, really important we actually just stop saying AI as a whole and then talking in really broad brushstrokes because we run the risk of not doubling down on AI where it is working and where we should put effort and we run the risk of demonizing it in an area where a different type of AI or a different application could have much greater effects. And all this boils down to trust. We're in a period where we are figuring this out. We're in a period where clinicians, patients, and there's another article in Pigeon this week about trust, about this exact thing. We're in this period where we're trying to build trust with technology that could really change the way that we deliver healthcare and make it far more sustainable, far more accurate, far better in lots of different ways, but does also run the risk of us losing out on some parts of human to human interaction and empathy and all that sort of thing and we're trying to figure this out we're trying to double down on where it works to build trust we can't do that if we talk in broad brush strokes we can do that if we're incredibly clear where we're putting it why we're putting it there analyzing if it works why it works and being transparent about that whole thing and that requires detail that requires specificity in the way that we talk about this and the way that we uh the way that we do it. Yeah, it's interesting. And as you said, looking at this report, just for one example, um, it says what technology has seen the most progress in two years. It starts with artificial intelligence and then has a series of other things underneath it, virtual care, integration, interoperability, mm. patient engagement, data analytics, et cetera, et cetera. Any one of those could include AI. So it's, re- it's interesting that it's kind of getting blurred together um and it's seen in some cases as something separate um but actually probably its proliferation is also not being acknowledged but you talked about trust um and i'm keen to understand from your perspective you have a pretty good vantage point i think in healthcare and health tech and how these kinds of technologies are being used. Do you think that trust is is shifting within health tech and healthcare to embrace, let's use it, AI technologies? I think it's difficult. It is a little bit difficult for me to say because I think the most important area for trust is, well, there's two most important areas. There's the patient and the clinician's. And I'm not talking about trust between the two of them. Of course, that's been built over many thousands of years of doing healthcare in a quite a similar way. I'm talking about the, how patients trust AI and how clinicians trust AI. We've seen from a few recent studies that patients are actually expecting AI to be doing stuff where it's actually not in healthcare, which I think is interesting. Um, but there's another angle as well that if clinicians are going to use AI, they need to trust it. Do I think it's changing? I, I, perhaps. I think, to be honest... Clinicians could take it or leave it, whether AI is involved. The question is, does it work? I think ultimately that's really all that clinicians care about. I think, you know, that there'll be clinicians in some areas of the country that are getting x-rays back with a red dot on it, which is where an, an AI thinks that a problem is and where it's worth looking at. I don't know how many clinicians even know that AI in inverted commas is doing that. They probably just think that something as part of this software is doing it and they have a look and that's where most of the problems are and it helps them make decisions. Um, so if, the, if they know AI is involved, I don't know whether they care. I don't know, but if they do know, then yeah, they are going to need to build trust. I think that also depends like how much AI is doing as well. So in that example where it's, it's not, it's clinical decision support in a way, but it's really light touch and it's putting all the emphasis on the clinician to really still make that decision. And it's, you know, treating the clinician as the one that, that that's in the know. It's just sort of helping you along kind of thing. Um, where we're talking about AI and large language models potentially, you know, really helping with 
dare I say, diagnosis and things like that, where it might be going through loads of electronic notes and identifying a rare disease and that kind of thing. I think there's a huge amount of trust that's required there because um, you're, re- you're, you're going to be acting on that information to be more liable. And uh, I... I don't know. I I can only assume that it is just with time. And I, th- I think, and the reason for that is I think AI seeps into everywhere else in our lives, clinicians too. And therefore there's a higher level of understanding. There's just a higher level of trust of what it can do. And people talk about things like the, the banking industry and how banking, nobody could ever have perceived that you would ever do banking without going into a bank and speaking to a human who did things on a computer right in front of you, or indeed not on a computer right in front of you before even that. No one would have ever assumed that you would able be able to get the internet and enough security and cyber security to even do that on a phone. But over time, you were doing everything else on your phone, it, it made sense and that kind of thing. And, and that's kind of where it's going in healthcare with patients. And I wonder if that's where it's going with clinicians that eventually, because AI is so proven elsewhere, we become a lot more comfortable over time. And the trust is there as well as picking up the odd use case here and there in healthcare and seeing what it can do slowly. I think I, th- I think it's a long game. I honestly don't know. We'd have to get a few clinicians on here to, to chat about it, I guess. But um. Yeah, that's sort of sort of what I think overall. Mm. I wonder if AI has the term AI has a lot of emotion wrapped up in it. Ironically, because I, I it, as you were talking, it was making me think about whether or not we even necessarily need to be using that as terminology. And you used the example there of a clinician seeing a scan with a red dot on it. Do they know whether it's AI? My question would be: Do they need to know? Do they, do they do they need to specifically know that it's AI? Because I sometimes think that AI can be polarizing. Um, it can make people have dis or people can have distrust. It can it can scare people. It can get people excited. And I think we see a lot of that polarization from where we are. But actually, if a clinician or whoever is using it, whether it's a clinician or not, if they are presented with a technology or a solution or something that they're using and they have it explained to them how it is doing the job that it's doing and what their responsibility is in context of that. Do you not think that perhaps dropping in the word AI actually might almost be scaremongering in, in some places? Like it's just not necessary to use that. And I don't mean pulling the wool over people's eyes and not being honest with them. But I kind of think it feels like a red herring sometimes because ultimately it's a technology doing a thing. For the most part, you would hope once it reaches clinicians' hands, patient hands, that it's been validated and it's been commissioned and procured and it's been through all of the regulatory and compliance standards that it needs to. Do we need to get so hung up on the fact that it's using AI? I don't think we do. Is the is the short answer. I think though, there's always going to be this tension because no matter what the new technology is, there's going to be people that are migrants to it. And there's going to be natives. So right now there are medical students in third, fourth, fifth year who are only going to ever practice medicine in the presence of AI. Then they're, they're going to hear AI and just think, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. That's it. That, that's in it. And when they're consultants, there's going to be the next thing that comes in that, they are going to have bias against. And similarly, there's going to be medical students then that are going to think, oh, yeah, of course that technology's in it. So there's always going to be this tension in some way. And so I think, therefore, I think there has to be some element of responsibility on the clinical world being open to new technologies and open to new innovation as a, uh, just as a concept. And I think that's something that, in some parts of medicine, I think we're really good at. We're really good, for example, when new clinical trials on drugs come out, we're quite good at adapting that. Like the way that we treat high blood pressure or heart failure has, you know, it, it really does change like every few years, I guess. Um, 
and there's that thing like you know once you finish medical school whatever percentage of what you've learned is is irrelevant and all that sort of stuff um so we know that we can do it in some areas of medicine it's just that we're not really taught that on technology because devices have stayed the same for so long look at you know the obvious one is like speculums and all the rest of it these are hundreds of years old technology still being used and we're not that comfortable refreshing hardware devices let alone software and so i think there's a job there which i think does a really interesting amount of lift on how ready we are for ai which is actually just instilling a concept and we talk in medicine all the time in clinical medicine about lifelong learning and you know you have to be revalidated as a doctor in case you've not done <laughs> like enough stuff to learn and become better and all these things i just wonder if we're approaching a world now where it really has to be baked into medical students even um and and junior doctors it, it has to be baked in that the new technology is coming in and it has to come in because the pace of change needs to be quicker to make healthcare sustainable is it a case of actually learning a framework to become comfortable with things like ai and finding a way to as an individual and as a specialty and as a collective body of clinicians like a, a new ethos for the way that we actually think about new software and technologies and ai and all these things because it's it's still somewhat reserved just for the people that are interested in it do you think then that he obviously talks about cultural change and generational experience and attitudes so do you do you think that we stand a realistic chance of shifting the perspectives of more experienced not just clinicians but people who are longer in their experience and in their careers versus people who are natives to technology and have grown up with technology in all aspects of their life do you do you think how successful do you think we can be in actually shifting that cohort of people's perspective versus actually just that generational shift in perspective that's going to happen naturally do you think it's do you think that there's a huge amount of work to do there and there's a huge opportunity to be able to shift perspective or is it a case of waiting for that change in perspective that we know <laughs> is to die off um basically yeah the, <laughs> no i'm no i'm i'm a massive optimist because i've seen i've seen my dad use an iphone who's in his 80s so and he was a chief nursing officer of a region so like it's very possible. Yeah, I guess. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's very possible. And and actually, I the inverted commas younger generation just need to find the way because there's always going to be an older generation. There's always going to mm. be you always need to have empathy for their learned experience through their life and careers who have seen billion pound electronic health records fail and all the rest of it like everyone everyone you got to meet people where they are and it's it's not enough to just say oh let's just wait for them to die off and then we'll solve the problem no like there, there's a, there's a cultural there's a, there's a cultural element here to org like private organizations and businesses have this problem as well and it has to become part of culture of, of innovating and learning there has to be this experimental uh culture to trying stuff being allowed to fail all these things are part of like private business all the rest of it i think obviously you can't you know randomly experiment with ai on the ground floor and, and <laughs> just deal with it failing and all the rest of it but i do think it is part of healthcare to find a way f find find a way of of making uh, a, a more laggard generation okay with it but again through time and through my dad in his 80s using an iphone he then on his own accord will probably think oh well if i had this on the wards back in my day i could have done blah 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 i could have captured all my phq9 testing on here and i could have done this and that and the other like i could i mean <laughs> you're laughing not, but it sounds like we should be more optimistic than i'm obviously being this morning and um i think you you do make a good point 
I guess one anecdote that I would share coming back to finance is absolutely that we would never have thought that we would get to where we are with banking. And I think I even said to you the other day, we found some cash. I'd sold something on Facebook Marketplace and I just chubbed it in a drawer and said, what do you do with cash these days? Um, and said, oh, I should take that to a bank. Banks do still exist. Um, and therefore, that pr- shows you the issue that we have with high street banking, um, which is down to people like me. But if I think about my nan, for example, she is not super mobile. She doesn't actually access a high street bank now. But up until my mum was able to support her, and basically my mum doing her banking for her by online banking, she would still be going to a high street bank. And so I do think that there are, of course, going to be examples of people who are going to sit in a camp like that. Um, But I do think that we, we have to do the work to bring people to where where the technology is and where the opportunity is and ultimately I I think also we can't be in a position where we complain about so many of the challenges that we see in healthcare but actually reach the stalemate where we're not really willing to accept change in order to solve it um so part of an innovator's role is adoption yeah frankly otherwise you're just an inventor so I, and this is one of the very first things that I learned in medicine that logic gets you pretty much nowhere. That you, you, you can logically say this is better because, and you, you can, you can say that until you're blue in the face, but it just won't fly because of so many other factors that you've ignored. And, you know, it's very, very, very humbling when you do your first quality improvement projects as a clinician and you decide something that's better um, and you've done that incredibly unilaterally and at the, uh, in its worst cases, you've done it something that affects other people. So for example, I, I've told a story before, but like when I was, when I was on anesthetics, the, 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 there was someone that designed a new drug chart um, not a new drug chart, a new anesthetic chart, sorry, which has all the drugs that you give. It has the place for the, uh, the obs during the anesthetic. And then on the back, it's like a, it's like an A4 single open fold, right? And on the back is then an obs chart and a drug chart for recovery, which is the nurse's bit. The doctors don't do that, that that's all filled in by, by the, by the recovery nurses. And, you know, someone that I was working with in completely good faith, had redesigned the whole anesthetic chart around um, what, you know, he and others wanted that that were part of the project. And as part of it, just redesigned what they, what what they thought for the, for the back of it. And I can remember I'd done a few projects and I was, was, was no expert, but like, I can remember he came to me and just said, you know, why, why is this not, uh, what, why is this not working? This is better. Like, why, why does no one like it? Why is not, why isn't, because there's two piles. You could either use the new one or the older one as part of like the, the evaluation of the project. Everyone will still pick the old one. He's like, well, no one's using the new one, even though the new one's better. And so, um, I mean, it, it seems obvious now, like being, being in, in an innovation and startup world where our principles are like, listen to your customer and get customer feedback and like all these things. But in a clinical world, these aren't concepts. These, these are new concepts for people. And what I did was I basically took the drug, I took the, uh, the anesthetic chart and then just w- went to the nurse's office and just stuck a pin in it on the board and basically just put a post-it note and just said like, roast me, basically like, tell me everything that's wrong with this. And they, they did so much work on this. They, they annotated it and they drew what they wanted and all these different things just for that back page redesigned it and all of a sudden the, the the thing's great and it fits everyone's needs and now everyone loves it and they gravitate towards it because now it's done way better but and that's the thing like if you want to get something adopted you, you you have to listen to people and you have to do that and so when it comes to like oh this is better the old people just need to get on board or get out the way i don't think it's, it's just not good enough it's just not a good enough mentality and so part of the innovation here part of ai innovators work is basically to just listen to those that are in those clinical spaces where you're going to try and put your innovation and try and figure out 
what their reservations are and mitigate for them because all of that is adoption. That's the hardest part. And that's how you're going to make it sticky. That's how you can make it work initially. It's how you're going to go with your, you know, early adopters and initial users and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's not easy and it's not sexy and it's messy and it's a lot of human factors stuff and it's a lot of convincing people and talking to people. And it's, it's just all, there's, there's no, there's no SaaS model of doing that, I guess. There's no easy kind of tech solution of doing that. The unit economics of it don't feel right because you as the um, most expensive person in the startup are having to go and have these conversations which are very qualitative and it's, it, it doesn't feel, it feels odd. But this is the thing with healthcare. We just don't operate on SaaS economics at all. Um, and even if you are a SaaS business, you don't really either because you need humans in the loop and all the rest of it. So... That's essentially, I know we've detracted a bit from the original thing, but I think where it comes to AI, yes, if we're going to adopt AI at scale in healthcare, then there are a lot of people that we do need to gain trust with and convince that it does work. And we might just need to wait for a lot of time where they come to us because they're using it else, you know, in every other part of their lives, or we need a bloody good case of convincing them. Um, or to your point about, you know, red dot radiology. Do they even need to know it's there? Possibly not. Mm. I actually don't think we've deviated too far because actually it, what you've just said there has echoed really nicely another article we've got in Pigeon this week, which is an interview with uh, Professor Raymond Bond from Ulster University who talks about the importance of human-centred design in AI technologies and also in the deployment of technologies and and just how important that is. And he specialises in computerised electrocardiology. And he, he talks a lot about going to where people are and understanding what people need, both from a, a values and value perspective, but just truly understanding where they are and how you can help rather than just projecting something onto them. Um, so, yeah, that's all really to say that I think it's an important conversation that we continue to have. And I think, you know, there are lots of really great ideas and solutions out there, but we see often so, so many times where not enough has been done, perhaps, to bring the user to the centre of what is being created and then frustration once it's been created and deployed around why it hasn't been implemented or people aren't engaging with it in the right way, which actually could have been mitigated for far earlier in the process. Um, and in, in healthcare, as you say, you can't do anything on a wing and a prayer. And, you know, famously we say as well that just one extra click for a doctor can just be a a matter of success and failure for any kind of technology solution or new system or whatever it might be, because that extra click actually means something for them that has an impact on their day and their experience. And therefore that can have an impact on what happens for the patient because they decide to do or not do something. So uh, yeah, it's not, it's not a conversation I think we can stop happening because it doesn't we can it's not a conversation we can stop having because it doesn't feel like it's something that is happening in sufficiently widespread scale i would suggest i know you feel very strongly about the interplay and intersection of ai and people particularly as it pertains to clinicians and patients and those interactions so having read this interview what is your take on it well first of all raymond bond sounds absolutely fascinating and uh if you're listening raymond uh i would love to get you on the podcast and chat to you uh, i will be reaching out has a particular interest in identifying methods for optimizing the collaboration between humans and ai and that is going to be so important for Loads of reasons that we have talked about here about building trust and all that sort of stuff. And <laughs> it's a bit of me, some of this work, um, particularly, 
obviously talks about like ethics of AI and AI supporting clinical decision making, everything you'd expect from someone like this. Um, and themes that I know that we talked about on previous episodes. So I'm not going to bore you with all of those again, but there's just one thing mentioned in this article, actually, uh, before I go on to an amazing quote, but there's one thing mentioned in this article that I've thought about loads and has been a, a real point of anxiety for me that this is completely exposed and brought up gloriously. Bearing in mind, I'm an anesthetist and have used in clinical, acute clinical scenarios uh, where people's hearts have stopped and having to use defibrillators to restart them, essentially. Um, Raymond is working with others on the usability engineering of automated external defibrillators. So if you've ever been to, I don't know, a swimming pool or a public space where they have a defibrillator on the wall, something that's meant to be used for the public so that a member of the public can actually defibrillate someone. Um, Raymond is is looking at the usability of that device, given that it's critical uh, so that members of the public can use it in a potentially life saving scenario and it's funny because do you know what when i look at the one at the uh, i play tennis at a little tennis club where i live and there's one on the wall and i always think to myself if i actually had to use that i would have no idea i'm completely reliant on hoping that it looks something like i've potentially used before but then i think to myself actually no members of the public would have to use this so in some ways it would have to be amenable to them and i'm like oh god they'd have to use it on automatics there's probably an automatic mode i'd want to use it on manual but then can i remember the manual stuff like all this stuff just goes to my head anyway i think this type of work is absolutely glorious because I don't know, when I think about those defibrillators and the fact that a member of the public would have to use it, I, even I'm anxious, let alone someone that's not got a medical background using it. So in, in terms of where my passion is on stuff like this, the incredibly practical, the incredibly practical gap between a technology and a human using it, I think is a fascinating space. Um, and to just leave you with a quote um, from Raymond Bond here, Perhaps we need to remind ourselves of what it means to preserve human values, well-being and happiness and repeatedly ask ourselves whether an AI technology could negatively affect our well-being and happiness in both the short and long term. Of course, it might be challenging to predict the long-term effects of AI technology, but perhaps we can at least try. And that is is what I've been talking about recently with where we put AI in healthcare and us at least defining where do we want it clinically and where do we not? What do we want the human roles to be and what do we want them not to be? And I think that sums up the importance of that. To reassure you, I've used one of those defibrillators in training, not in a real life situation. And there is a voice that talks you through it, tells you where to stick the pads and when to step mm. away. So you'd be fine. You'd be mm. absolutely fine. I don't think you can switch it to manual though. So that might annoy you, but. I wouldn't these days. <laughs> you you would be absolutely fine. I, even I can remember it. So you'll have no issues. Well, interestingly, there's also a trial in nature, which we have featured this week as well. And it talks about behaviours with behaviors of people at home who are using technology it doesn't actually specifically call out ai but i think you know it's it's an interesting follow-on from what we've just been talking about but people's behaviors and how they interact with technology and their behavior in response to nudges and that technology and the data that they receive versus how they respond when there is a human being clinician person involved um, and essentially, the study is a decentralized trial that reveals these home testing behaviors for respiratory infections. And it found that basically people were more likely to seek a test for symptoms that they were experiencing 
if they had been advised to by a clinician than if they had been nudged to by their wearable, which I think is super interesting. And again, it is very much linked in with the role of AI slash technology, where it fits and you know, bringing in these kind of human values and understanding human behavior and how that influences uptake and change ultimately. Um, so I think it's a really interesting example of, I guess, seeing that in practice and, ha- and how it might play out. And I think definitely uh, would reflect your personal experience of how you interact with, with wearables, James. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so long story short, if you're the one that's recorded your symptoms and you're then told to take a test, you're more likely to do it than if the wearable has told, has recorded those symptoms and concluded that you should take a test. It comes down to trust, doesn't it? And it's not surprising to me that people trust their reported, their self-reported symptoms rather than a wearable, wearables recording your symptoms if you see what i mean it it, it doesn't strike me as surprising and perhaps the point of this is that some people do or that maybe we should trust wearables more or maybe okay is this a are we expecting some sort of trust to build and therefore wearables will get to a point where we where they're reading biomarkers that we can't even perceive. And actually we need to build this trust in wearables so that when they get to a point of interpreting biomarkers that we cannot, then we don't, we, it's impossible for us to report those symptoms and therefore those wearables will be able to do lots of extra stuff in the future. Maybe that's the the context there. I don't know. And I can kind of get on board with that. Um, but yeah, it, it does come down. It does come down to trust and we're clearly not there with, wearables as much as some people think we are or i I don't know but um yeah it's not it's not news to me let's put it that way i as you know i do not do well with wearables um i but then that's my own issue of (laughs) like a little device telling me what to do rather than me actually trusting it i actually do I, i trust the data from it um but i don't know a lot of artifacts maybe i don't actually trust the data from a lot of it because i'll be able to explain it away and i trust my own intuition more let me ask you this then so lots of people use wearables we talk about how data should be more joined up and what if someone had some kind of wearable that reported it can report to the patient or the person not necessarily a patient but also reports into a health record or a dashboard that a clinician can see and that then sends either the clinician that notices that flag on on their reviews and makes a recommendation for certain testing to the person or it goes via the clinician and that is then reviewed and an automated nudge is sent via the clinician is that is that better is that the same thing could that work so it's a great question um and i think we have to make a distinction between two things here one of them you, what you're talking about is the sort of ambient recording of certain uh signals determining a range that you're happy and unhappy with and then you know the creation of of actionable insights that will then determine an action which needs to a patient behavior or the rest of it i think that is completely an an absolutely reasonable um to be trusted where you've got a very specific signal against a really specific issue so f- take for example heart failure let's say you've got something that triggers when i mean here's a an example that's 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 been used like weight scales people retain fluids they increase their weight therefore uh they can measure that at home um or indeed they can be i've seen <laughs> like stuff over the years where people have 
try putting the things in shoes as well so the patient doesn't actually have to do anything it's just part of their daily activity that or they'll step out of bed onto a plate or whatever it is and, and that and that feeds back and they will get nudged um i think yeah that it's reasonable in that scenario um but the other one is prevention like a, a, a normal fit healthy person undergoing this and they're needing to prevent something is the other one and i think that's that's less obvious to me that's less i don't know valid for me because i'm i'm just less likely to trust it i because i'm not confident that we're there with normal range optimized range of all this sort of stuff and if something's telling me like mm, you're not doing so great uh I guess I know too much to be like, hey, I don't trust that. I actually trust how I feel over that stuff. But I'm perhaps differing some explanation. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think there probably is something unique about your your perspective on it. Um, and I can speak to that from our very. I mean, we are different people, but our different levels of engagement with wearables. And even when we're talking about baby monitors, for example you very much not being in favour of a sock that a baby would wear and you essentially getting obstata, me being more ambivalent towards that, but you being far more less trusting of it because you don't think that that has come as far as it needs to and therefore maybe the data isn't going to be as trustworthy and actually that based on your experience, your, your gut feel will be maybe more beneficial in that situation. Well, that's an interesting one to, that, no, no, that's a, that's an interesting one to talk about. So... Th- the the reason for that actually is is false positives and artifact and and noise and what ultimately is false positives it's that thing alarming and me thinking that my newborn baby is dying when the sock has come off so that's what i'm worried about there i'm actually more considerate of my own overall health with regard to that and actually that's a quite an extreme example of why of my at- my personal attitude to wearables being fit and healthy as I am being fortunate to to be that way that I don't want the extra cognitive load of these these small adjustments in and around normal um which I would consider false positives like all these signs and signals and things that I'm being asked to do to just maintain normal I'm sort of like broadly i know that if you sleep eight hours and you move your body around and you eat not rubbish like you're gonna be fine and and that's what i'm optimizing for is like less cognitive load whereas you know and 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 in that so so i'm reducing my false positives of things to do there and i guess it's the same in that scenario of newborn baby with with sock that's monitoring vitals all the time that i guess knowing i've got that trace on my phone or assuming it goes there i don't know am i gonna be looking at that all the time i can be over over worried all the time and you know if the sock comes off and then i think my baby's dying and they're not but then of course there's the obvious argument of well what if it does save the life and i guess does that make me negligent as a parent if you can afford something like that and then you don't and I don't know. I, I, I don't know about the sensitivity and specificity of it enough to make a solid judgment that others should act on, but I know how I feel myself. And yeah, it's, it's, it's preference. Um, mm. Yeah, I guess. I also think that I take your point on, are we there with prevention? And I think, Potentially we aren't, but I guess if you took out the word wearable and you put in remote monitoring, that happens, that's in place. Um, So, you know, people are wearing technically wearable technology, likely in their own home where you think of virtual wards and that kind of thing, which sends data back to a clinician, allowing clinicians to make decisions about a person's care. And I guess for me, this is symbolic of a step removed from that. As you said, it's more thinking about a healthier population or an, perhaps an at-risk population rather than an actively unwell population. I think I think it's an interesting um, direction of travel, but it does go to show how important 
trust is, keep coming back to it, but trust is and actually how that information is delivered. And yeah, if if knowing that that data that has come from whatever kind of technology it is that you're using has gone via a clinician for you to then receive that nudge, whether that helps build trust. Definitely does. Definitely does. Knowing knowing that a clinician has interpreted the data before it gets to you is is definitely going to build trust. Um, I without any shadow of a doubt, it's not going to take it away, is it? And so I, I think, yeah. And, and by the way, like remote monitoring in, vir- in a virtual ward setting, I completely, completely get that. Even if that is completely automated, I, I can definitely appreciate that there's a high level of trust there because again, it's, it's parameters that have been set against a specific signal that genuinely means something when, which is like a really big delta. You're not talking about shades of normal here, which is like, you know, splitting hairs and, it's the, th- it's the same thing that anyone that's done any sort of renal medicine is, is always a bit like, uh, I don't know, grimaces a little bit when people talk about, oh, my potassium's a little bit low, therefore eat a banana. It's like, well, is you, is you really like, what's the, what's the variance on, on just the test that, that, that could be high or low side of normal? And is your kidney, are your kidneys really going to have a higher baseline of potassium if you, if you, or are you just going to filter it out like it's 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 interesting like a lot of these a lot of these narratives and yeah i guess we're in an intensive care unit you just you just i don't know you have all these sort of appreciations of scale completely you know completely um like decimated with um you know seeing babies on nikki with a ph of six point something you're like well can we really talk about like alkal alkalizing your blood water and like all this sort of stuff like oh, if i have an alkaline liquid diet because I, I need more alkaline it's like well i don't know your body's gonna sort that out pretty quickly like I, I think you'd really struggle to make yourself more alkaline realistically but i don't know history history might i might be on the wrong side of history let's put it that way and i think i, I do think somewhat there is you can also come across a little bit arrogant with this sort of stuff with especially being a clinical medic and all the rest of it you never know what the world's going to turn into and 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 what parts of this might actually become real or not and i think you, you to an extent you should have an open mind where where things have worked for certain people and and figuring out why that is and all the rest of it and um what is it they say about you know future technology is like indiscernible from magic uh because if you show people in the 1800s what we've got now they would think it, it's literal magic. I'm sure there's things that, you know, in 500 years time, we would consider now magic or impossible and unreal. So you should always approach this with some sort of humility as well for what might be possible in future. But um, yeah, no, the shades of normal thing. I think of, of course there will be some, a lot of things that we discover. Um, yeah. I'm just not, just not convinced by it totally right now. Well, who'd have thought that we'd go from taking photos in a nightclub on a pink Motorola camera and uploading them to Facebook after a night out and then panically panicked checking all the tags in the morning to actually just having a camera on our phone and no longer uploading them to Facebook, although Instagram is now giving us 20 photos in a reel. So, you know, who knows? But that that could be magic to some people. It's amazing to see how far we've come from that perspective. Well, I think we might have tired out AI in healthcare for at least a couple of weeks. All I will say is tune back in next week for when all of you have returned from the beach and we've got some heavy hitting headlines and I promise, I can't really promise, but I promise we'll be talking about something other than AI. Um, but you never know. It might just be because it's using AI and we're just not using the term AI. Come back next week and find out. And if you would like to get this week's stories, make sure that you're subscribed to Health Tech Pigeon and click all of the links. You can read them all in full, as well as obviously listening alongside our analysis. We will see you next week. 